All right. <laughs> Hi, Dave. How are you? I'm awesome. How are you? You're doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Um, Good. We're, uh, we're, we're very happy to have you here at the Soil Nutrition Conference um, talking about, I think the write-up talks about biology, but you have other things to talk about as well. Um, <laughs> uh, sentient, sentience and uh, who knows, who knows what all. So um, welcome to your first, uh, first time with the Soil Nutrition Conference and I'd say take it away and we'll, uh, we'll do Q&A in an hour or so. Cool. So that's it. Did you, no introduction, I'll just go for it? Yeah, I mean, everybody who, everybody knows who you are, you're Nicole Masters, you're uh... uh, you're, you're too funny. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you want to right. yourself, feel free. Yeah, you can. You I can will just it. shoot into it. And yeah, if anyone wants to ask questions as we go, I'm more than happy to kind of, you know, reply. Um, yeah, and I think we will just get into it. So just tell me if, if you can see my screen. Yep. Looks good. Fabulous. So what I'm wanting to dig into in this session and just looking at the previous sessions you've done on this conference, which have just been extraordinary. Um, I guess we're building upon some of those dynamics and you know, really thinking about what are the signals that we are sending? How is it that even microbiology and plants even communicate and and how how does that influence our practices? Like, what are we doing and who are we communicating with or who are we farming and ranching for? So that's the question I'm out to kind of dig into. Um, this is me when I was like, I don't know how old, six, five. Um, I grew up on Air Force bases um, until I was about 10 years of age. And this, this picture makes me look really old. My parents had to triumph. My, it's my grandmother's car. Um, but what was kind of interesting in living on the Air Force bases was the amount of um, exposure that we had to different types of chemicals. So we could actually smell Avgas. We lived next door to the Avgas refueling station. And recently there was actually a, um, a news article that came out that the area that we used to play in as children, that we'd play in... Um, in the ditches and ride our bikes there was these really cool like um tunnels and stuff that we would play in were actually found to be highly contaminated with some of these um substances that have since been banned um and so these areas are actually being excluded to be cleaned up but the interesting thing is it's had an impact on my mum as in in their maternal role in terms of um, being pregnant in these environments um I have a breakdown in the methylation gene, like a, a mutation, which is due to this exposure to early ag chemicals. And what it means is that my body won't detox properly. Um, my middle brother had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and has um, some really interesting allergies to weird things that cause um, ankylosis spondylitis. Um, and my youngest brother has Down syndrome. And at the time there were four mothers in this area on the street that were all in their early 20s that all had Down syndrome children. All right, so what's going on here and what we're starting to globally understand a bit more is the role of epigenetics and how epigenetics can actually change that gene expression. Um, so your DNA is the same, right? So your DNA is what gives you the fact that I look like my mom and dad. Um, it's uh, what's going to affect Say you have black cows, that's that's their DNA. You know, we're not going to change that necessarily with DNA, but epigenetics is um, how that DNA sequence it changes. It ch the DNA sequence stays the same, but the epigenetics is what is above that. It's the protein that changes the gene to signal to switch on for certain things, right? So basically, we talk about epigenetics in terms of you are what your mother eats, right? So in, in uh, in this process of epigenetics, every single gene um, has that same DNA in it, right? And so you can take uh, a cell that would be for muscles or could be for fat or for bones. And what happens is that that cell will receive a signal that'll get it to turn on. So in this case, this muscle cell is switched on by the liver gene turns off and the gene to turn on muscle switches on. And this instance, the liver cell, so same, it has the same DNA, 
but the signal for the gene, the liver gene is switched on and the muscle gene is switched off. So that's what turns that into liver and this one into muscles, for instance, right? So there's a big part of it that's actually driven by our environment. So for epigenetics in people, so how your gene is expressed, um, it could be from things like uh, when you're actually in the womb. So stress or nutrition and toxins will all influence how that gene expresses itself. Um, early childhood abuse, so things like drugs, alcoholism, suicide, um, that, that those early signals, that early change of the epigenetics actually changes you as an adult. So it leads to um, people that have a lessened ability to deal with things like alcohol, um, are more likely to commit suicide, more likely to have poor relationships, um, have a reduced ability to deal with any kind of stress. And that was actually programmed while they were in the womb, right? And then things like chronic diseases, uh, things like rheumatoid arthritis, this is when the gene expression becomes deregulated, right? So we no longer regulate for healthy joints um, and we instead deregulate and have joint issues. And what they've discovered is that Although epigenetics um, can be altered by these stresses, things can actually change that gene expression if we're able to, let's say you've got a child that has something happened maternally um, or there was some kind of stress early on, that providing um, love to these children, physical touch can actually switch these genes on and off early in life. And if you're able to switch those genes, then we see an increase in resilience to stress or anxiety and an increase in health and well-being, right? So it's, um, it's really, really important uh, to love our children, <laughs> to hug children, um, and to you know, spend a lot of time with that loving touch because it actually reprograms how your genes respond to disease and to stress later on in life. So just there's a lot of experiments obviously done on poor mice and rats. Um, and one of them, and you might have seen this uh, study, it was pretty cool. They exposed male mice to a cherry blossom smell, and then they gave it an electric shock multiple times. So every time it smelt this smell, they would then give the poor thing an electric shock. So it began to associate that smell with the incidence of being electrocuted. But what was really interesting, and, and they used IVF in this case, so there was nothing that was passed on in terms of like a male rat having a conversation with its child and saying, hey, watch out for the smell. Um, so they used IVF. And what they found was that offspring would respond to that smell and shake with fear, even though uh, it, ne it never knew that there was going to get an electric shock. And what they found was trauma was inherited and inherited as many as four, um, four I'm trying to think of the word, progeny after that point, all right? So this, this genetic memory of trauma can be inherited and passed on down through generations. So this also ties into instinct. So wondering how is it that an organism has an instinct or knows to forage this way or knows to look for this kind of um, threat? It's because they've been programmed genetically, epigenetically to switch on those genes to respond to these things. So they did a study um, mating um, mice. And so they mated a runt uh, male with a mother mouse. And what they found was when she mated with that small male, that she actually withheld nutrients to the embryos and she made these runt babies. So you'd think, well, she's got a runt boyfriend. She might have runty babies. Uh, when they did this with IVF, they actually found that the babies were normal, that um, instinctively she knew to withhold nutrients because these babies perhaps weren't going to be very viable or, or thrive very well in the environment which is really fascinating. So if we think about epigenetics in animals, we can actually affect uh, these epigenetic processes through the environment, so the exposome. So things like um, the stress on both male and female, like sire and dam, uh, maternal behaviors. So things like uh, good mothering skills, that a mother licks its baby, that it cares for its baby really well, actually passes on to things like immunity, um, and milk production later on in life. So if there's been some kind of stresses in this place, so uh, say there's been poor nutrition or there's chemicals, um, environmental stress, so there's been quite a bit more research in epigenetics looking at heat stress on livestock. So um, that's obviously a really, really, really big one, but also management practices. So things like, low. so this is my hypothesis, but things like low stress animal handling, what impact is that having when that calf is in utero and then how that ends up 
um, going on for the rest of its life or lamb or whatever it is that you're raising, right? So this is a world that we're seeing increasing focus on, but I think there's a lot to it in terms of what are we doing when we're managing animals and then how does that affect um, gene expression? Because this all relates to things like how well that animal is able to process food. What is the meat or milk production um, or egg production? Uh, what its disease resistance or its wool qualities are is all afflicted, affected by these epigenetics. I know we've been focusing so much just on the genetic side of things, but there's a, there's a whole nother story. Um, and obviously there's a lot of money to be made in genetics and we're seeing um, obviously companies go, hey, you've got this gene and this gene is for this kind of cancer. So therefore, um, you should just chop off your breasts is what some of the options have been. But no, it's actually the environment has more say on how these genes are expressed than the actual genetic coding that you have. Right. So how can we influence that environment to have a better outcome for livestock? So thinking about things like uh, drenches or fly tags, how does that influence that calf in utero when it's saying so basically that epigenetic signal tells that calf, this is the environment you're about to be born into. So you're gonna be born into an environment that doesn't have flies, for instance, because the air tag will be saying, there's no flies around, I'm not getting bothered by flies. How does that change that epigenetic expression? Um, because you know, human DNA, we have that same uh, DNA all around the world, but what changes the expression is, what are you, where are you born? What was the stress? What, how hot or how cold it is? What's the nutrition? And all of that turns on genes to survive in that environment and turns off the ones you don't need, right? So how do we switch on the ones that, that we're needing? So we're seeing more and more focus of this in um, plant breeding. So they've found that by stressing a plant, making it go through hot, cold cycles, um, dry, wet cycles, that those inherited traits can be passed on for four or five generations, right? So things like seed dormancy or different biological relationships. So we're seeing that through breeding programs, a lot of um, plants no longer have that relationship anymore with uh, specific microbiology, right? Even things like heavy metal stress. So those microbes, so your fungi and your bacteria can actually alter the epigenetic expression of the plants themselves. So they can, they can um, support the expression to switch on or off, right? And then where, where a plant is growing and where you source that seed can either set you up for resilience or nutrition or not. And so I'm hearing more and more seed companies starting to talk about this, which is very exciting, but thinking about what were the conditions that that cultivar was growing in? Is that something that I want to have on my property or do they just douse it in a whole lot of agrochemicals and, and nutrition and soluble nutrients? And, and, you know, maybe that's not a good fit for what I'm doing. So what I want you to think about is how the soil is this living matrix. There's an underground metropolis that's full of all of this chatter and carry on and all of these microbes, like so just billions and billions and billions and billions of microbes, right? And they build these cities underground, okay? So there's hallways and corridors and living spaces. And that entire time that they're in this space, they have no eyes, they have no ears, they have no taste buds, all right? So microbes in this space need to be able to signal and communicate with each other and know if there's a threat coming, uh, know if that is food. So they've adapted to live in these environments. Um, and I sometimes think of actually of underground being pretty similar to a horror movie. Like I would rather swim with great white sharks than be a teeny tiny microbe in the soil or all the different things that are in there. Like there's a vampire amoeba. There are fungi that'll take over your brains and turn you into a zombie. Um, these organisms that'll just absorb and slowly, you know, like, slowly, slowly kill you. Um, so yeah, there's an interesting world that's happening under there. But how they know who's around is through these receptors on every single cell. So imagine every single cell wall has 100,000 receptors. And it only takes a parts per trillion for that cell to respond or hear or listen to that signal of, are you my friend? Are you my foe? Are you dinner? right or has this environment got warmer colder what's the nutrients in here we've we got adequate phosphorus or zinc or whatever is these receptors are waiting for these types of signals 
So there's a huge amount of what they call crosstalk and chatter that's happening underneath that soil environment all the time, to the point that actually, while you're walking across a landscape, those, microbi those microbes all know that you're in there and there are carbon responses and there are signals that will respond to you walking into your field. And in fact, those signals will go right across the field very, very quickly to say, oh, look, Jim's back, which is either good or bad. I don't know. <laughs> so we think about um, plant signaling. So obviously plants have smells that come out there. Um, flowers, you know, there's different types of um, nectar, different types of volatile organic compounds, things that plants are using to communicate all the time. And that might be to communicate to a pollinator. It might be to communicate to other plants that there's a threat. It might be to communicate to parasitic wasps, for instance, and say, hey, I'm under attack right now. And what's super interesting is they're finding that these signals are being disrupted um, by the form of air pollution. So if that's ozone or nitrate or hydroxyl radicals or even smoke are actually changing how plants signal because uh, one, they're feeling like no one's listening anyway. Um, and then these um, volatile compounds don't travel as far obviously in smoke. And so what we're starting to see is these kind of reductions. So strong smelling roses that you might remember as a child, we don't see as many of those things anymore in cities because plants have decided not to allocate the same amount of resources to try and share these communication pathways basically. So they're doing that under the ground as well. So there's root de deposition and different types of communication. So we have different types of material like being sloughed off the edge of those roots. So there's mucilage, there's microbiology, so there's organic matter in that material. We have solid, soluble organic substances. So those are your sugars, amino acids, organic acids, enzymes, soluble secondary metabolites. We'll talk about those. Um, fatty acids, and then what we call the volatile organic compounds. So um, these compounds can move through the air. So things like carbon dioxide, um, alcohols and aldehydes, for instance. So these are all molecules that um, plants can be using to communicate with microbiology. Um, so these secondary metabolites, you've probably heard this terminology a lot, but what it means is um, it's, not an, it's not something that's directly involved with the normal growth and development of a plant, but it will be something that the plant might be using for um, defense compounds. It might be what it's using to make, its, um, you know, make it smell nice. So we have phenolics, alkaloids to you know, stop animals overgrazing. Uh, terpenoids, essential oils, so all those smells, your flavonoids, so the actual flavor profiles, and then all the things that humans seem to like, which is all the drugs, right? So um, <sighs> morphine, opium, um, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, all of this are all what we call plant secondary metabolites, and then the antibiotics, right? So plants are producing these types of substances all the time. Um, and they're very important, but also microbiology are doing the same thing. So microbiology around those roots are releasing things like auxins and cytokinins. So those are your like phytohormones. So it's gonna help actually a plant to grow. And then we have volatile organic compounds and the signal molecules that we call autoinducers, which biology are releasing all the time in response to plants, right? And those, those signals can actually alter the gene expression, the immunity, the defense, metabolism, and growth in the plant, right? So they're signaling to the microbes and the microbes are signaling back. It's fascinating. One of these processes is called quorum sensing. Uh, a quorum basically means that we have enough of a population that's coordinated, um, that they then are releasing enough of these metabolites to communicate. So it basically says, hey, there's enough of us in the room now, uh, we've reached this threshold and now the gene expression changes. So that child down the bottom, maybe she had a couple of organisms in her throat, like strep organisms, but they weren't virulent. They get to a certain population, they switch on, now we have virulence, or now we have biofilms, or now we have bioluminescence, which is the picture at the top, right? So this quorum sensing is what enables organisms to coordinate it and to switch on and switch off. And it can happen across different organisms as well. So this could be bacteria and fungi um, communicating and doing this. And quorum quenching is when that biology gets switched off. So there's a signal. So they developed one for cholera. So you can drink this. It, um, it tells the 
tells the it tells the other cholera in your body that basically there's too many cholera here and they should just leave. Um, it's at parts per trillion. It's the signaling metabolites and it will switch that cholera off. And what's really interesting is that that, that signal is the same signal that can be applied to a plant to switch off botrytis, right? To switch off fungal diseases. I uh, don't think it's commercially available, um, but the work has been done. So I want you to imagine on the left is a plant that um, is being exposed to disease and has no presence of trichoderma. So trichoderma is a fungus that eats um, other fungi. And so without the presence of trichoderma, we see disease on the left-hand side. And on the right, what happens is that plant sends a signal that says, hey, look, I'm coming under attack. And on the left-hand side, there's no trichoderma there to respond. On the right-hand side, when it sends a signal to trichoderma, the trichoderma releases a volatile organic compound and it stimulates the whole priming of that enhanced defense system. So salicylic acid, abscisic acid, jasmonic acids are all released for plant defense when they, when they find the signal. So it's so cool is that if you don't have that microbiology, this whole priming and defense system in a plant doesn't happen. So consider how many environments where we have very low biological diversity, very low biological activity, is we're undermining this whole system. Um, so uh, the question is, are various responses to COVID-2 virus due to quorum sensing or none, and therefore de dependent in part on viral load initially, or do viruses work differently? Um, I couldn't ask you, I couldn't answer that question in terms of um, viral um, pathogens, but again, consider that obviously there's viruses around all the time. They are the most common organisms on the planet. Um, does one viral vector in your body make you sick? I don't know. Um, okay, I'll keep, I'll keep, keep going. All right. So uh, our goal really is how do we optimize biological diversity and biomass as much as possible? Because over 80%, and I'm actually being pessimistic because it's much higher, over 80% of plant health and nutrition is driven by these biological functions. So the more communities, the more signaling that's going on, the increased resilience that we have to stress, the more epigenetic alterations that can happen, and the improvement that we see in crop health and in quality, right? So one of the ways that we can do that is to look at what's happening in the seed microbiome. So uh, this is something that's been kind of a more recent discovery, and it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, but there's biology inside a seed, all right? So some of that's come from say the mother plant, so from vertical transmission or horizontally from air or soil. So where that seed grows, how that plant um, sets seed, what was the, the circumstances is all gonna affect that seed microbiome. And then obviously doing things like putting a seed treatment is gonna undermine some of that. So we need a good healthy seed microbiome. It's gonna speed up germination. It's what helps that plant to induce defense, especially when they're little, little guys. So things like damping down, you know, that really shows that we haven't got adequate microbiology when that plant's starting to germinate. It's gonna help solubilize, solubilize nutrients, fix nitrogen, um, and it produces plant hormones, but it can also produce or also contain pathogens. So if you're growing those seeds in an environment that's not um, super biologically diverse and healthy, then what else is in there? You guys are gonna talk about rhizophagy, I think next month with uh, Dr. James White, you're in for a treat. Uh, but one of the take homes from him uh, and in the literature is that 30 to 100% of seedling nutrients come from the absorption of bacteria at that root tip. So having microbiology, um, having good intact biological communities is going to set those plants up nutritionally. Right? And part of those processes, we'll see the formation of root hairs, um, which are actually initiated, um, and this is James White's work, but through having bacteria inside that root and irritating the roots and then forming root hairs, right? So we wanna see that we have a whole lot of root hairs on that um, root surface because that's gonna help with water and nutrient uptake and disease protection, right? These are one of the things that we look at visually, like are you seeing root systems that look like this? And if not, why not, right? We call these the, I call them the Rastafarian roots, but they are a rhizosheath so they look like great big dreadlocks hanging off these plants. 
And this is what's really going to enable that plant to have defense against things like temperature fluctuations. So what I find is most branches that we go to in farms is that uh, people's plants have naked roots. Dig a hole, take a look, and what you find is if those um, plants are naked, there's none of this um, soil sticking to that, then they are now incredibly vulnerable. So all it takes is a cloud to come over or cold at night and you get this massive fluctuation in temperature. It's very stressful. Um, they, uh, these riser sheets will buffer those roots against um, low or high pH by as much as two units. So instead of a pH of five, that plant might be experiencing seven or a pH of nine, experiencing seven, right? Developing riser sheets like this from the minute that that plant starts to grow, uh, we will see a buffering against sodic conditions or um, high aluminum, high um, heavy metals is that we get this buffer in the system. So the game becomes, how do we get riser sheets like this? Are they easier to see in sandy soils? But you see both of these images are from loans. So developing a riser sheet is a big part of the visual way that we can tell is, are we getting biological communities? Are we getting plant defense? So we talked a lot about the different types of signals. What's gonna disrupt that is all the usual suspects, right? And the same probably in the human body, right? So stress, pesticides, having low nutrition, particularly calcium and boron, um, they are absolutely critical elements for plant defense. Um, what kind of, what, what's happening with trace elements? What are you doing with your management? So things like cultivation, overgrazing, Water logging is all gonna have an impact. Um, all the things that we do to mismanage. And if you think about a lot of this stuff, it's just modern agriculture, right? So everything that we do in modern agriculture really undermines plant signaling. I also wanna add in breeding. So seeing plant cultivars that will no longer signal to mycorrhizae, even though they're mycorrhizal, or they will not um, signal to protozoa, for instance, which are very important organisms for nutrient cycling, right? And then if we have low organic matter, that's gonna disrupt the cycling. So I wanted to show an example of this in action. So this is the Too Lazy Two Ranch, um, Steve Charter out in Shepherd. He has a 12 inch average rainfall and a 40 inch pan evaporation. This is one thing I really like you guys to look in for yourselves is um, we see people talk about rainfall, but you need context because uh, a 12 inch rainfall in Canada is very different from a 12 inch rainfall in New Mexico or Western Australia or New Zealand, right? So it comes down to pan evaporation. So you'll generally find these measures at like a local weather station will tell you what your pan evaporation is. So what that means is how much water will evaporate from a dish in a year. So even though it's getting 12 inches of rainfall, what evaporates is 40 inches, right? And this property goes from 3,200 to 3,800 feet elevation. And 30 odd years ago, he started with adaptive holistic grazing. And what they found was up here in the mountains, they got phenomenal changes. They saw a huge lift in the types of plants, the carrying capacity, uh, the density of plants. Um, and, it, and it was a huge success. Down on the lowland, however, they didn't experience the same success through changing their grazing management. And uh, Steve really felt like he was pushing up against the wall, that it was like, what other tools do we have if, you know, if we're doing intensive? moves, um, very, very low organic matter. So 1.3% on his lowland uh, compared to 3.3 up here. So this is Steve. Um, what he's got going on on the right hand side is he started setting up large scale worm beds. So that is one of about six or seven worm farms that he's got going now. Um, and he started to create his own vermicast. Um, why vermicast? Because Vermicast is full of these biological signals. It's full of enzymes, it's full of hormones. I talk about it like it's the elixir of life, right? It's the catalyst that will um, switch biology on or switch plant responses on or turn on plant germination, right? So this is how we got it out. So he's applying, he kind of blew my mind in terms of what's possible in, um, yeah, rangeland. Uh, so he equipped this, army jeep army truck here and put up a slurry sprayer so he could actually mix in two pounds of vermicast with a little bit of molasses and in some areas he did a gallon of fish and he sprayed this on originally he just did some trial work and that's what inspired him to actually set up the worm beds after seeing some of the changes that started to happen in his um, sward <laughs> so on the left um uh, 
left bottom. Uh, that photograph was taken in 2015. And what he has was predominantly um, crested wheat domination and lots and lots and lots of bare ground in between. All right, and that's pretty much what the places look like for 30 years. Right? He's never seen a lot of changes from that. Um, and after the application, what he started to see was the germination. So on the so both of these pictures were taken um, early spring uh, when there was some soil moisture. But what happened was we started to see the germination of a latent seed bank. So plants that weren't very common. So um, needle and thread, Indian rice grass, a lot of Western wheat came in. Um, but just seeing this switch away from crested wheat, which a lot of people up here really struggle with. <clears throat> I'm in big timber, by the way, Montana. Um, and so, yeah, that was the catalyst for him to, all right, cool, let's get this out because these, these signals, these two pounds of vermicast doesn't cost a lot per acre. Um, and he, he treated about two and a half thousand acres in that first and again in the second year. All right, so the other thing that started to happen was dung beetles. Dung beetles just came through the roof. It was crazy. Um, in two different cow pies, we counted 700 dung beetles. Um, I say we. He actually sent off a sample to Jonathan Lundgren um, and Patty Armbrister. Also did some sampling and counted 700 dung beetles in one cow pie. I've got the video. It's very cool, but it wouldn't play on my computer. All right. So what I want you to consider, there are signals for germination. So there's signals for what's going to um, switch a, a plant to germinate or not germinate. So every bit of soil that you've got, like a yard of soil has like thousands of seeds in it, but what is it that choose, chooses to germinate, right? And you'll see these patterns, like maybe you've had a bit of rainfall, um, you know, I've been driving around just seeing people really impacted by drought who then had, you know, a pretty heavy rainfall event and suddenly you get different weeds germinating. So I want you to consider that there's gonna be signals. So that might be because you've got bare or disturbed soil. It might be because you've got low organic matter, Maybe you've got a major mineral imbalance. So if you have low or high minerals, we're gonna get different types of plants trying to um, work with that system. So let's say you have low magnesium, you'll have plants that will come in specifically that can increase the available magnesium in that soil system. And they, they could do that for like a hundred years and they'll balance your magnesium or you could figure out what they're trying to say to you. So there's a lot of plants that are telling us there's microbial imbalances. So maybe they are very bacterially dominated or very fungal dominated soils. Um, that sends a signal to different types of weeds to germinate. Um, and then as a safety valve to toxins. And I would include nitrates in this. So if you guys have had really dry periods and you've had bare soil, um, what we find is that dry period, nitrates will build up in that bare ground. And then when you get a little bit of moisture, uh, what germinates then are the nitrate loving weeds. So things like kochia, thistles, foxtail barley grass, um, amaranthus species. So uh, pig, red root pigweed, fat hen, all of those, all right? So those types of species um, are trying to mop up an imbalance in nitrates. So starting to listen to what is it that my land is telling me? What I kind of think of it a little bit like you've got your fingerprints all over your soil, all over your landscape, and these types of species are telling you things that are going on. So take both knapweed and cheatgrass as indicators. They, um, well, knapweed, you know, has allelopathic chemicals. So if you think about the signals it's sending, you know, it, it sends out some pretty powerful chemicals to inhibit the growth of other plants. Um, cheatgrass will stop the um, proliferation of a lot of fungi and it will cut uh, mycorrhizal colonization down significantly where we have cheatgrass. And what they're doing is they're creating the environment perfect for themselves. So some weeds we can think of in terms of succession and some of them are like, hey, this is my place and I'm not going anywhere. Um, they will change that soil over time, but there's things that we can do to kind of shift them on. Like what are trying to do. So this example here is from the Oswald Ranch. I'm down in Cotopaxi in Colorado. Um, and what we, oh, just wait, uh, did my internet, is my internet good? <laughs> All right. So what they did was they applied one, you're back. Yeah, two pounds of, uh, it's okay, oh, good. You're not on the internet. Okay. 
Okay, uh, two pounds of a high fungal Johnson Sioux compost per acre. And they just did these one acre test plots, right? So last year they actually did an application across the fields, but they had no very, very, very low rainfall last year and didn't see any response. Um, this year, what they've seen in these fields that are really heavily degraded, like last year, all that grew in these fields was um, purslane um, and a little bit of cheatgrass. And then where these test plots were, so they actually drilled a cover crop across the entire field. But to look at that, you wouldn't think there was any cover crop there except for these patches. So where they did this two pounds an acre equivalent of a high fungal extract, it switched on the signal for these plants to, to thrive and to survive. And also it um, switched off the signal for the, um, the cheatgrass. So what you see in here is sorghum sudan, um, buckwheat, uh, turnips, other things that they've been planting in their mixes, right? They did the same treatment out on the meadows, which, which they'd actually measured were high in fungi and they found no response whatsoever. So this is where context is important. What is the current soil situation and what is it that you could do to ameliorate whatever situation you're dealing with? Um, but I thought that was a pretty cool trial. So if, um, if you're concerned about taking the seed dressings off, and if there was one thing I could recommend more than anything else is uh, please stop using the neonicotinoids. So some of the nastiest chemicals around uh, a common seed dressing for, in for insects, totally non-selective. Um, so if, if you're concerned about taking off those seed dressings, then there's other options, right? So coating those seeds with either a high fungal compost or vermicast. There are lots of commercial um, products or dripping biologicals actually down beside the seeds. Um, and we can even put vermicast actually down the drill as we go. So there are lots and lots and lots and lots. So don't get overwhelmed by this, but there's lots of products that we can put down with seeds. And um, my favorite really is compost or vermicast. Um, we're putting about 30 pounds of dried vermicast down the drill on rangeland. Um, but we can buy commercial inoculants. So the one down the bottom right, that's trichoderma. You can breed this up yourself. Um, and like a lot of these, like the subtilis, um, there's lots of these products that you can actually, if you get the source material, you can breed that up for yourself. So commercial in inoculants might include things like your trichoderma, mycorrhizae, um, bacillus subtilis, uh, different types of macro and micro elements, or even seaweed I find is really good at just providing a broad spectrum of nutrition for the plants, a lot of, you know, tiny, tiny amounts, again, parts per trillion, there are auxins and gibberellins, so hormones in seaweed, um, as well as the trace elements that a plant might be missing. Uh, there are organic carbons, so actually anytime you're thinking about putting seed down or putting fertilizer, anything, anything that you're putting out onto the ground, put it down with some kind of carbon type product. Um, I'm going to leave these slides with you. Anyway, um, there are different types of phytohormones. Uh, there are enzymes that you can, can commercially buy or you can make enzymes yourself, right? Just through uh, making extracts from plants. Uh, willow extract is very high in salicylic acid, um, which is aspirin, right? But it's also very important for um, like root, rooting. Um, so yeah, putting that into your compost teas or your extracts would be great. Um, and then, there are other biologicals. And then there's some of these pest and disease controls. So looking at people dealing with grasshoppers this season, um, there is a metarhizium species that will infest. So that, that image there of that little grass grub, that's metarhizium. Um, they're very specific. Um, they're more host specific than some of the other organisms that are around. Um, we buy it in New Zealand pretty cheaply. I'm finding here in the US, it's quite expensive. But anyway, hopefully someone will start making it a little bit cheaper for people. Um, but what's kind of cool is these organisms are native in this environment um, and it's been our management that's got rid of them. So there's things that we can do to manage to bring back some of these natural biocontrols. We can use the technique of natural Korean farming to make a seed dressing. So you can mix 12 pounds of a really lovely mature high fungal, high nematode compost. You can mix that with some molasses, half a pint of milk, and you're gonna make it into a slurry. So it's like a batter, um, so thick enough to coat the seed, but not so thick that it's just gonna pour everywhere. All right, you're gonna sieve that in case there's pieces of wood like that. That there is my vermicast, right? So my vermicast used to be very fungal dominated, lots of wood chips and everything in it, um, beautiful inoculant. 
And then you're going to take that that you've just uh, and mix that into 50 pounds and just mix it up so it's pretty well mixed. And then you can add it into 500 pounds of seeds, right? We just find if you don't initially mix it and you try to put that batter straight into 500 pounds, it'll clump up into balls and you don't want that. Right? This example here uh, from Grant and Naomi Sims, this is how he does his extracts for, uh, I don't know, let's see, 85, oh yeah, acres. 8,500 acres. Um, so what he's got there is just like a burlap sack and he's running. Um, so it's just a reticulated water system with a trash pump, just running that water through that vermicast that he had only just put that bag in there and it immediately goes that lovely chocolate brown color. That's all your humates. That's all that um, spores and all those enzymes and signaling metabolites that we're talking about. This is the basis of his program. Um, and he's seeing extraordinary results. I really recommend you look him up. So Grant Sims is in um, Victoria, Australia, used to be the chairman of Victoria No-Till. So he's been doing this since 2008, very low input, very high output. So that picture on the, so on the left, that's what his system looks like to just get um, his compost extracts down. He does use a little bit of soluble fertilizer, but not very much, no pesticides, no fungicides. Um, on the right hand side, those are called slaking jars, so they put a whole lot of soil into those, so the left is him, the right is the roadside, or the middle is the roadside and the right is his neighbor's place who was a conventional um, cropping. Um, but you can see the amount of soil that's being dispersed is a really good indicator of how well is microbiology working, very easy test for you to have a look at for yourself, use the same soil type, these, these samples were taken about 30 feet apart. Um, and what we find is that soil will stick together because of all the poos and wheeze and vomit and all the things that microbes make to stick that soil in place, right? And what he's seen as a response is huge improvements in soil health, obviously in soil structure, his water holding capacity and how water moves through that system is just phenomenal. And the other thing that's really cool is just to see the change in, um, in uh, insect biodiversity. Um, asking the question of if you don't have cow's milk, um, can you substitute sesame milk? Uh, no. Um, very different properties in sesame milk than cow's milk. So cow's milk is going to stimulate lactobacillus in a huge way, which is why it's so important in Korean natural farming. Um, so source it from regenerative humane operations, if you can find them, go and milk your own cow. <laughs> you don't need a lot to be able to, to make some of those preparations. Um, but milk has a whole lot of obviously calcium, um, protein, phosphorus, all sorts of benefits and microbiology go nuts when you put a little bit of milk out. Um, what was kind of cool on this operation is um, Jonathan Lundgren had actually gone out for a look, uh, the entomologist from South Dakota. And apparently he was running around like a kid in a candy store just exclaiming how how much biodiversity insect biodiversity was in these fields um, and insects is such an important obviously um, disease or other insect predation um, pollination but also they're a huge source of nitrogen and phosphorus in themselves so we want to see more insect biodiversity in here not less all right and then I'm sure many of you have heard of Ian and Di Haggerty, Prospect Farms. There are 45,000 acres in Western Australia. Average, average rainfall is eight inches. I don't know how often we get average anymore. What they're doing is their entire program is based around worm liquids. So they use half a gallon an acre of a worm liquid. And in, in season on their really degraded land, they are using compost extracts at 12 gallons an acre, right? So they are taking on increasingly degraded land. A big part of their operation too is their sheep. Um, and they're feeding those animals like a nutrient dense food. They're using low stress animal handling. They're asking the questions of their land, which Pascal was talking about, about um, where is it appropriate for sheep to be right now? Where do they need to go? Or when should they be moved? Uh, the crops that they're growing have no residues, um, high nutrition, they break down really fast. And what they found was when they're taking on new land, by introducing sheep that are native to their ground and are full of all that microbiology, that their soil health program is actually sped up by about a two year period by bringing in these animals compared to if they just brought sheep um, from a sale barn that didn't have all this biology in it. 
Um, so they're using these animals basically as their inoculators. And then when we look at epigenetics, uh, epigenetically through nutrition, they've had massive changes to the micron size in their wool. So it's gone from 22 to 18. Um, so significantly finer and higher quality wool just through this process of epigenetics. It's not breeding, it's done that. Now, this is super fascinating. Uh, when they first take on some of this degraded land and this particular block had been receiving maybe up to five herbicides a year, including some stuff that may or may not be legal. Um, and so they took on this really degraded land. Um, they didn't do any post-emergent herbicides. If they did, maybe a bit of spot spraying, but basically what they found was in the first year, up came things like button grass, kerosene grass, windmill grasses. So kerosene grass doesn't sound like a good idea in Western Australia, does it? <laughs> All right, so early successional grasses, that's fine. They just left it. So what you're looking at here is down the rows of where an oat crop has come off. Um, and so in their second year, they had a rainfall event in summer, oat crops come off. And what came up was the Ceratia species. It's a native C4 grass that they haven't seen in the area for like 60 years. Uh, and it just came up in the rows. So those rows received the, the worm extract and they also would have received a little bit more moisture being that it is a row. Um, things are pretty darn dry. But this is the process of plant signaling. Who are we signaling to? What do those worm extracts or enzymes or any of the metabolites or things that you might be putting down the drill or influencing through your management, right? Thinking about grazing management, grazing timing, manure and urine, those are all signals to biology. Who are we turning on? Who are we turning off? So one of the super fascinating things about their soil, so Prospect's the name of their operation, is they took samples of the soil that had um, uh, herbicide resistant radish and ryegrass in it, and they sent these samples into a lab to do germination tests on. Um, and so these, these samples were only, again, taken about 50 feet apart um, across a fence line where areas had been treated with the worm extract and then areas that hadn't. So the green and blue hadn't received any worm extracts and the red and purple had. Um, and what they found was that where they'd been exposed to the vermicast within that two year period, you were able to kill herbicide resistant plants at half the rate or um, pretty much half the rate. Yeah, if that's trifurolin or glyphosate, right? Whereas the areas that hadn't had any exposure to the worm extract or compost extracts uh, is still herbicide resistant. No surprise there. This for me is a game changer. Like really, if we could get this kind of information out to the cropping community at large, um, there's a whole big world going on in terms of herbicide resistance. So if you think about herbicide resistance, plants which are glyphosate resistant, so Roundup, have an overexpression of the shikimate pathway. So glyphosate works on the shikimate pathway, um, and basically these herbicide resistant weeds overexpress that gene. So it defends them against having a downregulation of that shikimate. Now what's fascinating is that um, aromatic amino acids are what halt that overexpression. So things like um, fish applications with your herbicides, um, again, using some of these vermicasts and these compost extracts. So always adding some kind of carbon form with your glyphosate. Um, I recommend using fulvic acid, um, but even if you chucked a little bit of fish in there, if you have a lot of herbicide resistance, we're seeing this problem shift away really fast, right? There's over 600 species now herbicide resistant in the world. Uh, we don't need to genetically engineer them with 2,4-D and dicamba. That is not the solution. <laughs> surprisingly. Right, so we talk a lot about diversity. Um, everybody talks about diversity. It is one of nature's rules in life. What I want you to look at here is just look at all the different types of root architecture. So the more different species that we can get in there, they're mobilizing different nutrients. They're signaling to different types of microbiology that have different roles that might be stress resistance or access to phosphorus or whatever it might be. But the more diversity we can get in the system, the more signals, the more that we set ourselves up for resilience and health, right? And one of the biggest things I see is compaction, right? So you've really got to look at how do we address compaction? You've got waterlogging. We need to create these well aggregated soils. It's absolutely key because this is what enables roots to penetrate. It's what's enabling biology to move around. It's the health that we need for some of these disease suppressing organisms. Um, it's what enables those volatile organic compounds, those signals from roots to microbiology to travel well through the soil. So 
the more that we address compaction and, and, and support that plant in building well aggregated soil, then the healthier we're gonna be, right? So this is my last slide. So keys to lifting plant and biological signals. So optimizing bricks, so that's plant photosynthesis. Are those plants healthy? Have you got diversity in the system for diverse solar panels? Uh, reducing any types of plant stress as much as you can. How do we do that? Make sure you've got a riser sheet. Right, are there any major macro or micro imbalances? Take a look, test your plants. What are the weeds trying to tell you? And then using practices which build carbon. So anything that's gonna help you build your water holding capacity. So um, don't overgraze, um, not tilling and these kind of approaches. Um, you know, if you're a smaller, maybe you're gonna put compost on, but yeah, providing diverse food for those microbes. So it might be seed dressings, might be biological stimulants, and then focusing on diversity, 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 whatever we can do with that. Thanks for tuning in. And if you haven't got a copy of my book, there it is. Just, you know, Dan, just you know, gratuitous plug. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to leave lots of time so we can go down rabbit holes. Beautiful. Um, yeah, well, um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's there were so many pieces there that I think, you know, are not as... Um, often discussed as they should be. Um, hmm. <clears throat> I mean, quorum sensing, you know, is a is a is a key piece. The communication with the between all these different organisms and the metabolites that that accomplish that. Um, hmm. You know, the connection to the. I mean, communication. You 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 touched on it lightly. I know you touch on it sometimes more um, <laughs> uh, directly and indirectly. You you referenced referenced Pascal. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I guess this is a time for people to, to post, uh, questions in the Q and A if they'd like, um, we can start with Severio's question. Um, and I will certainly feel free to, um, offer, offer points if, if there's not anything coming up in the Q and A. So, um, yeah. Severio's re question refers to issues, um, urban with the compounds and, you know, shutting down and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, their 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 zucchini and squash are, are flowering, but they're not getting pollinated. We live in the Bronx. Um, what do you do about that? Or is it the lack of lack of uh, <clears throat> pollinators, or the chemicals, or the plants being overwhelmed by the psychic, you know, five G? Possibly, maybe the final yeah. thing to say is the connection between well-functioning microbiome and the capacity mm -hmm. of the plant to build those secondary metabolites. My understanding is you cannot have those secondary metabolites until microbiome is functioning well. And so I don't think you said that exactly that way, but I would just- You can say that? I invite you to comment on that if you'd like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. And I mean, this is the whole point is we're starting to see, we can't just look at plant. We can't just look at root. We can't just look at bacteria. You know, they are, all connected in the hollow biont is what they're terming it but i don't like these science words you know it's like it's all it's all interconnected right the the yeah. hippies were right um and and without the nutrition as well so you know think of some of the roles of boron uh, and the importance in that and some of these signaling molecules when you take a look at a lot of the quorum signaling molecules boron is in that um, yeah. And so yeah. if we're lacking some of the trace elements and we're lacking microbiology, that plant can't make those secondary metabolites for that smell or for that flavor profile. So you guys know all about thinking about your flavor profiles and nutrition is they go hand in hand microbiology um, and intact healthy root systems. Um, there was a question there about the zucchini not flowering. Um, I would it's be flowering a lot, but it wasn't getting pollinated. So said. it's flowering a lot, but it's not getting pollinated. So often anytime things are happening in that with plants, suspect you've got an issue with pollen tube formation. So it could be a boron deficiency again, because that's what helps to fill that. Um, but yeah, there could be something nutritionally going on. And if it's just in your home garden, I would get some nice broken down composted chicken manure as a really good source of, of boron and take a look. But uh, generally, you know, if, if plants driving that way, there is some kind of imbalance. Um, it's interesting that it's flowering a lot, but not making any fruit. That's where I would be looking. Microbes and minerals. I just like to say M&Ms. You don't- M&Ms. Microbes and minerals, you know, 
<laughs> Certainly the microbes are, are take precedence, but if you don't have the minerals, even in many cases in the drier zones you're talking about, I think boron is still deficient. It just oh yeah. It's just about everywhere. Everybody needs more. Um, yeah. Well, they lost it when you lost organic matter. So when we lost the soil that was lost, you know, 80 years ago, the huge amounts of soil movement, and you think the very finest particles in soil, the first stuff to blow is your humus and, and your, your borons in that, I mean, your phosphorus is in that. So the first stuff to blow away was some of these trace elements, and then we're on a rapid decline. Yeah. Um, Adagio says, uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. Um, wondering if there's different results uh, from applying vermicast at different times of the year. Um, multiple times for the season. You can read the question. Yeah. Well, it's gonna, I mean, different results just in, in terms of where are you in that uh, process, how dry are those soils is obviously going to give you a different result. We're getting different results based on the quality of the vermicast, obviously. So, you know, what do you, I used to make different types of vermicast. So one for strawberry producers, one for avocados, one for pastures and think, <laughs> what is that community that that plant needs what are the signals that it needs so you know vegetable production we want it slightly bacterial it would be a, a less mature vermicast or compost but i think in times of, in terms of the year like if i could be out doing foliar applications um i would and then doing a soil application i would <laughs> yeah more is more is better but in some cases once is amazing well, well that's what's been blowing my mind is again comes down to what's your context you know in New Zealand highly biological soils or thinking even people that are maybe in Vermont or something where you've got you know some beautiful topsoil and lots of biology is you might not find that the worm extracts do a lot for you at all um, but in these dryland environments we're seeing some uh, really rapidly visual stuff they did some work in Tasmania um, in vineyards with vermicast and found that a single application gave them seven years of a response, but that was worth about 400 pounds an acre of uh, under row. So yeah, some of these responses can be very long, long lasting. Yeah, well, I mean, here in New England, I, I say, you know, I know my, I know my garden is doing well when I go out at night and I can flash a light on the garden. I can see worms every six inches. Um, so I figure I'm getting tons of worm castings per acre per year. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't happen in dryland soils. Um, is to your mm -hmm. point, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. And oftentimes we have other limiting factors here. Um, yeah. But I think yeah, some but of the castings. Are, I think the castings we see in earthworms is not the not the same concentration we see in composting worms. Like there's there are some differences. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Nina asks, uh, what kind of soil testing do you recommend to help farmers decide what biological amendments their pastures need? Hmm. I guess it depends. Well, what soil testing for what biological? So that I, I was going to answer it. How do you test a biological product? But what yeah. kind of soil testing? Yeah, yeah uh, there's quite a few labs that we use here in the US. Um, when it comes to biological amendments, I want to test the plant. So I want to know what's actually coming through the leaf. How you know, because you can have really high calcium, for instance, in a plant, uh, in the soil, but not see that come through into the plant. So being able to test and assess, you know, is that coming through? So we do a soil um, mineral test, we'll do a soil microbial testing, um, and we'll do a leaf test. And I don't want to push one lab above another. I don't work for any of the labs. Um, but yeah, you want a good biological lab that has... Um, you know, a history of data that they can show that that lines up with what people are seeing in the field. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Mineral, biological, and plant, but you're not going to give any any subsets, uh, any uh, types of assessments. University, no. Albrecht, or Reams. No. Or, no, no comment. Um, no, because I, I, there's pros and cons with all of them, right? That's kind yeah. of why I like a broad spectrum. And my that's probably maybe 10% of my consideration and the rest of it's the visual stuff. What are you seeing growing? What kind of plants? What does that soil structure look like? What are you seeing with animal health? You know, questions like the what's happening with fruit set, you know, getting all of that because that's actually more critical than anything that a test could tell you, but you need to be able to interpret it, obviously. Um, I am an advocate that you just get some baselines of your testing. So at least you can look and say, all right, am I moving my system forward or backwards? I remember Arden Anderson was one of the first people I learned from 
15 years ago in this whole world. And he always said, you know, the history and physical is 90% of the diagnosis and the lab work is 10%. So yeah. exactly to what, to your point, as a medical doctor, talk to yes. the person, you know, see what they're, what they're experiencing, what they're struggling with, you know, that should be what actually guides you, not the, not the, the lab work. I think it's a very important point. No, no, but um, I am a big one for, for testing weeds as well. Like, what are they trying to tell you? Is that a mineral? Are they dynamic accumulators? Are they trying to address an issue? Um, and, and, and kind of, we, we have actually done soil recommendations based on what the weed told us. Um, yeah, even though, sorry. So you take the weed, send it off to, for a forage analysis, yep. figure out what it's high in and say, okay, that's what my soil needs. Yes. Brilliant. Yep. Um, and the only, the only, um, only things that would be different in that would be sodium and nitrates. Those two, um, they, those are the two that would come out of that rule as such. But we would do, what we do is we, we test the desired plant and then we test the weed side by side and we'd also do our soil testing. So um, we're not, sometimes a plant might be high just because the soil is really high as well. So you want to be able to rule that out. So if it's when the soil shows low in something and that weed is off the charts and you'll find that um, like we, we typically see like zinc might be 10 times higher in a weed, the boron might be 40 times as high. You know, when we see those kind of differences and then you see it's low in the soil, you're like, gotcha, buddy. Thanks for trying to do that job. How about I do it for you? <laughs> it's helping out. Just helping out. Yeah, just helping out. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing the epigenetics of the plant that you're growing there would also have an effect. So if you're buying in wheat seed, it may not be able to access some of these things from the soil because of the core microbiome not being aligned. That's right. But if That's you're right. saving, saving your seed, maybe in the second or third generation, it's going to be able to access those nutrients in a way that it wasn't. Yeah, I think that yeah. was a very important point you were talking about with epigenetics at the beginning. Yes. So I think keeping your own seed or working with a seed supplier who's who's focusing on this regeneratively, and we're seeing more people having those conversations. So, you know, we'll test wheat and find that there's no zinc in that wheat. You know, that's in part because they don't have mycorrhizal relationships anymore. And you know, there's that whole cascade. So, yeah, but I was thinking more in like a field rather than like with pasture. But yes, test, test your wheat by all means against your kosher. <laughs> uh, and Juan asks, uh, where do you send your weeds to be tested? I'm guessing you'll be as the same labs. Yeah. So what you find is those um, leaf testing labs around the country are pretty good. I know John Kempf is a big fan of the sap testing in the Netherlands. I'd like to see a lab open up over here. Um, we used sap testing like 20 years ago when I was involved in horticulture. Um, it's more of a common test it has been in horticulture. So the fact that they can do sap analysis in grasses now is pretty exciting. Um, so that's something we'd be interested in adding to some of our diagnostics. But in general, you're suggesting more like a forage analysis. Yeah, just a for, so I want a forage mineral analysis. Um, and then with pasture, or like if animals are eating it, I want a, a wet chemistry analysis. So I want to know what is the relative feed quality and um, you know your neutral detergent fiber and protein as well as the minerals and I do them as two separate tests um, but that's just on the forage um, and then when I'm doing the weeds I just want to know the minerals yeah. minerally whatever we could tease all these all these subtleties out of you <laughs> <laughs> people are going to listen to this recording over and over again and they can take notes and try to hopefully <laughs> track it all out yeah <laughs> It's like it's oh it's so simple, but no, it's not. Yeah, you've got a lot, mm -hmm. a lot in there. Um, so okay, <laughs> what you can see the other side of complexity. You can see that it is simple, but yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anthony asks, yes. uh, what can be done to combat various harmful fungi in the soil, such as verticillium wilt? Um, it's a good question, and it's um, a lot of fun to do. I mean, having that situation means, you know, your microbial community is, is really disturbed and really at the, the, the bottom. And um, I worked on a property that had amylaria and amylaria was in um, commercial like sweet peppers and tomatoes and was totally decimating their crops. So they actually were in the process of digging all the soil out because nothing else worked. 
um, and removing that soil and bringing in new soil. So they had one greenhouse that hadn't been uh, treated. And so I said, can we, can, can you stop? Can we try this instead? And so we did um, these compost extracts um, and the recommendation I gave was for four gallons every week. And because the guy was making 50 gallons every three days, you know what he did. So <laughs> he did 50 gallons every three days of this high um, biodiverse extract. It was just amazing. Um, and it was incredible because that amelaria um, went, like the amelaria was gone. They grew these plants, they looked like triffids and they grew all the way to the roof. The only problem was they had no fruit. So that whole first year they had no fruit production. So they weren't very happy at all, but the amelaria was gone. Um, and that was like 10 years ago, that amelaria still hasn't come back. So it was kind of like, we're going to overwhelm that situation with those predator organisms, with things like trichoderma or pseudomonas, those organisms that are actually going to like consume these fungal pathogens. Um, pathogens are also telling you there's something going on nutritionally in that plant as well. So where's that breakdown um, in terms of, is it trace elements? Is it calcium? Is that plant no longer able to signal to say to biology, hey, I'm under attack because it's nutritionally deprived. Again, it's that, you know, hand in hand. So if I if this was a greenhouse, then you might do things like um, seed coating or plant soaking. So soaking that root ball in, in some of these fungal bi biodiverse mixes before you plant that um, and just set that plant up for success, right? So a lot of these wilts and these um, pathogens are secondary right they're not the primary problem there's something else that's happening before that but I kind of like that idea of like just going to keep throwing in the army and overwhelm them with numbers um, and yeah we have had good success <laughs> beautiful well you know bringing in the bringing in the polyculture it's it's really hard for the invasive species to be dominant in a polyculture so yeah and I mean you're saying a lot of things that you know I think I just was on a panel with with Elaine Ingham this week that are oh. soil food web type conversations, but I don't hear you saying anything about um, microscopes and assessing. So what's your, I mean, you're definitely recommending all the stuff that they recommend, but you're not, you don't seem to think that that sort of counting is necessary or do you have any comments? Um, I don't know about counting is necessary. So I have three microscopes, so it's not that I don't use them. <laughs> um, I find it takes quite a long time. Most producers I know that have microscopes don't use them or don't use them very well or don't know what they're looking at. So I think doing a program like this, the, like the Soil Food Web, to really be able to understand what you're looking at. Um, I think, I don't think you can do a compost tea and not know how to work a microscope. I actually think that you would be in trouble if you did that. However, the compost slurries and these extracts that we're using, um, as long as you have a microbial test for that, compost that you're making and send that off to a lab, you're just extracting all the metabolites. So I'm not too worried about who's functioning and who's not. Like I'm, we used to do compost teas commercially. Um, they are the biggest pain in the backside to manage. So I really prefer a slurry or a compost extract. It's like, I'm putting it all out. I'm sending it out with the food. It's kind of like Fukuyoka's thing of like, we're gonna throw that seed ball out with all that biology on it. Um, we don't have to second guess what did we brew. And a lot of the times when you're brewing, you know, you really do brew a lot of bacteria. You're going to brew whatever organism responds to whatever you're feeding it in that brew. Whereas I'm like, I'm not going to second guess this. I'm just going to put the whole thing out. I'm going to let the plant dictate that with the soil microbes and they'll work it out. I'm, who am I to try and tell them exactly what's going to happen here? So I'm just going to give them all the raw ingredients and they can do it themselves. So I'm just going to translate some of your, your, your technical terms. <laughs> Basically, what you're saying is if you take the compost and add water to it or put it in a bucket and stir it up, then you can you spread that out and you feel totally comfortable. It's mm -hmm. when you put it in a, in a, you know, a system where you're bubbling it and you're feeding yep. it and, and it's going for 12 hours of all this whole complicated process. That's when yeah. you're concerned. So yeah. what you're saying is basically take the worm castings, add water, spread, spread it. compost, add water, spread. You feel yep. totally comfortable with that. And it's when it gets more complex that maybe problems occur. Yeah. And I've seen people brew up diseases. I've seen people kill everything on a regular basis. There's so many things you have to check. There's so many things you have to clean. Um, you really need to know about your water quality. 
you really have to brew that and have a window where you're like, this all needs to go out now. And so when I was consulting, my average client size was 10,000 acres. We are not going to be, we need stuff we can store. And so an extract you can store, like you can actually have that sitting in great big thousand, 10,000 gallon drums until we need to use it. So much more user-friendly than a tea. Yeah. Yeah. No bubbling. <laughs> These are really, these are really uh, important insights. They uh, just um, kind of constantly flowing out of you. All right. Um, so uh, Matt, I, I have some tomato plants that have bottom end rot from low calcium. Instead of adding fertilizer, could I maybe use milk with water mixed? If so, how would you do so? 50-50 mix? Yeah, you can put milk on pretty um, concentrated without having too many problems. Um, but yes, you could uh you could try it uh, we have had some success with it so it's just about mobilizing that low calcium and just check sometimes it can be boron as well um so anything that's kind of you know moving nutrients to the edges so um that blossom end rot yeah so uh and use um we've even found like milk powder will work uh even like pasteurized milk will still work um two percent milk won't work because it's not milk but everything else will work. <laughs> Want to elaborate on that comment or just let it, let it sit? No. It's... Uh, no <laughs> well, they say calcium availability is predicated on boron, right? I yes. mean, and yeah, calcium, hand in hand. you have to have boron before calcium will move. So adding more calcium is not necessarily the issue. It is in so many cases of boron deficiency. And I say yep. borax or there are other sources that you can get relatively inexpensively, relatively, you know, yeah. locally. But, um, but that's why chicken... Chicken manure is so cool because chickens eat stuff and then they poop boron. We don't know why. They're like an alchemist. What comes in is pooped as boron. Like <laughs> I think it's, it's transmutation, which most people don't want to talk about. Yeah. Chicken but, poop uh, transmutation. Um, so I, I, I and yeah, just put a little bit on. You don't want to have too much because you want it broken down or other, you know, you might have a bit of ammonia and stuff like that. Yeah, well, and some of the chicken manure that we get in bags of certified organic, you know, fertilizer, it came from CAFO chicken houses that have all kinds of antibiotics and, you know, et cetera. Um, no, like, just offer like, to clean someone's chicken house out. <laughs> who's feeding their, who's feeding their hens, you know, good, good. Non-GMO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we may say. Okay. Um, so a long question here from uh, Lenore, actually, looks like she's got three questions. Um, wow. Wonderful connecting the dots. Can you talk a bit more about quorum sensing and plant signaling? Newish terms for me as metaphors applied to planetary and human health. Let's just do that one. Do that for, one. Oh, it's, it's, oh, it's a beautiful it's a question, question, Lenore. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have obviously quorum sensing in our guts, obviously. So the microbiome, what makes your biofilms, fungi and bacteria in the gut system are all communicating. Um, and so some of you have quorum sensing that's gone awry because you'll have like a candida outbreak or something. Um, if we're thinking about planetary or human health, um, these signaling metabolites are the foundation. If we think about everything's communicating all around the planet all the time, um, and these metabolites are part of that signaling molecule. So if we think about desertification, what was happening with atmospheric cycles, the microbiology that's in even precipitation, all of this is interconnected. So um, it has a massive impact in terms of planetary and human health. So the more that we can start to restore, I guess, like the neural pathways in, in the soil, and, and that's through our management, um, then we're going to start to see a, a shift. But until that, like, for me, I don't separate what's happening with human health and, and soil health. Like, people are very malnourished their microbiomes are blowing, they've got diarrhea and constipation and they're super stressed and it's the same in the soil. So I think really starting to see how there is no separation and, and these stresses we're seeing on human beings right now, like there's so many people that their minds are about to explode with just stress overload, right? And we're seeing a lot of anger and a lot of people lashing out. Um, it's been phenomenal for me just driving around in the last two months. I've been to 22 different ranches around um, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, and just seeing communities that are just in really, really dire shape, um, and seeing soils that are in really dire shape, and it's been a little depressing until I got to a couple of regenerative places who were like, "Oh yes, we have water holding, we have microbiology, we have diversity," and. What's wrong? Oh, 
but the impact <laughs> on the human psyche of being in that landscape is just phenomenal let alone breathing all this smoke and everything so you know it's it's all interconnected so signaling if i can just pull out that that term and i think you framed it as as biochemistry but we understand that biochemistry is vibration um quorum sensing vibratory coherence you know i mean i use the metaphor of of the not a metaphor i think it's a, a fact of the you know the female insect is flying to the and the male insect from two miles away can smell her and yeah. You know if you understand insects you know that they don't have very well developed noses and mm -hmm. you know a logical question might be how much pheromone must a female insect emit to have a field four miles wide strong enough for a male insect not to be able to smell it and my understanding from you know phil callahan's work is that it's really his antenna on his head which are tuned to the frequency of that vibrating molecule and so it's not you know, it's not the it's not the smell sense. It's the it's the vibration sense that mm -hmm. um, is how nature communicates broadly. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if that. If you have any comments there, or I just want to pull that out. Well, I, I think some of the new new ways of communicating, even thinking about atomic structure, is no longer this idea of an atom and rings, but rather waves. Right, so everything is just energy and just waves. So you get a combination of molecules, they make a wave. Um, and it's the fact that if you have 100,000 receptors on every single cell, doesn't matter if it's a human or, a, or a, an insect, they're primed to, to sense things. And it's like our ability to sense geosmin. You know, we can smell that smell of the earth, you know, that beautiful smell when there's been a, a rainfall event. We can smell that at like thousand times, thousands and thousands of times the dilution of what a shark can smell, a single drop of blood in a swimming pool. To even um, try and figure out how is it we can, we have a receptor that's recept receiving geosmin. Like why, and scientists don't know, which I think is fascinating. I kind of think it's because uh, the soil is our mother and we're like, oh, mama, love you. Um, <laughs> But our you know, saying, mm, stay here. This is a good place. <laughs> stay here. This is healthy. Yeah. So how we even have that ability is is mind blowing, and it, everything's energy, it, and it doesn't matter how we want to explain stuff. Every everything is energy. Yeah. Well, I think it's a it's a it's a wonderful conversation to hopefully be able to you know deepen over time. Uh, so Lenora's second question here, just watching time and and running mm -hmm. um, a little bit low and having questions left. Were you suggesting it's okay to use um, biocide glyphosate as long as you add carbon? Seems counter to your image. Um, I would rather have people use a buffered herbicide than cultivate. So, say, and, that again. say, it, say it slowly, say it again. I want a buffered, I would rather have a buffered herbicide. So we buffer it with our fulvic acids and our vermicast than have people cultivating. And until we get closer to- We need to disturb the soil, tillage, you know, bare, bare cultivation from your perspective is more destructive than a herbicide, you know, strategically used. Yeah. And so we are using low rates of these herbicides because the other thing with buffering means you can use less. Um, and what we're finding is we're testing those crops and they're testing cleaner than organic, which yeah. I know is going to yeah. spin some people's wheels. But the reason for that is if you have a microbially intact um, soil system and you're feeding it with that little bit of carbon. Uh, we, we did some some cool work done on one of my orchards in New Zealand, um, and they found that um, you could apply high rates of 2,4-D, which is a type of very persistent herbicide. And after applications, there was zero evidence of any herbicide being applied. It wasn't in that soil in, at all in these very biodiverse, very alive ecosystems. So if we build up that resilience and build up that health, there is a buffer for them to be able to, to um, break these compounds down. Um, I feel like all the herbicides are crap. I don't care if they're organic or not organic. The, anything that's going to kill plants is going to have some kind of negative impact. If that's some of the orange extracts or vinegars or whatever people are using, um, glyphosate obviously is getting a whole lot of beat up and I can understand why. But you could do the same beat up on atrazine or dicamba or 2,4-D. Like all of them are not cool. Yeah. Um, this is one tool uh, until we can get closer to some, uh, you know, I'm seeing people 
trying organic no-till and having all sorts of issues. Like I said, average, well, my average cropping size is probably 30,000 acres um, to try. And I'm interested in how do we, how do we have this conversation with all of agriculture? And you start talking about zero herbicides, they're, the current only option is cultivation. And I, I don't want to see that. Well, I think it's a very, very important point. And, you know, to the point of nutrition, it seems to be that when the, you know, when the biology is functioning better, the nutrients are greater in the crop. And so, you know, I, coming from an organic background myself, you know, this is the kind of thing which is fairly, um, <clears throat> what's the word? Uh, <laughs> inappropriate, considered to be inappropriate to say, but, you know, yes. if you look at the overall biological system, it does seem that these things, um, you know, that there is a balance between these things. And I just, I appreciate yep. you, you know, saying that clearly. I think it is yep. important for people to hear and that I, message. What I, forgot to, what I forgot to say at the start, like thinking about the epigenetic changes in my body left me vulnerable to paraquat poisoning. So I was poisoned with paraquat when I was 15. Um, I was very sick for a long time with it. Um, and it was because my genome had been changed so it couldn't process it so I meet people that spray themselves with paraquat and they're perfectly fine but my body was not so I am a big advocate to get chemicals out of the system and I'm also a realist um, so I'm kind of interested in okay how do we work with people let's start getting it out of the system and what's super interesting is we start to see the shift in the weed dynamics so that people are using less and less um, and so some people are not using well, using minimal herbicides, maybe 30% of what they used to use, um, yeah, on large acreage. So. In, in management strategy that's facilitating where the biology digesting it so it's not present on the crop, right? That's your, no. your point is these compounds can be digested by microbes when they're functioning at a reasonably high level. And so, you know, there's a cost benefit right. analysis, but um yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a very important I, thing. Thank you. And what that. we're seeing is glyphosate is in your rainfall here, right? So 90% of American rainfall has glyphosate in it. You talk to guys up on the High Line in Montana and we talk about the geosmin smell of rain and they're like, no, no, it smells like herbicides. So literally <laughs> herbicides are coming out of the air. So even organic crops up there are being rejected from EU because they have um, glyphosate contamination. The biological crops are, are coming out clean. Even though it's in the rain, the biology's on that leaf surface and it's eating it up. And the now, growers are using it and it's coming out clean. Yeah, and, but we don't have any research to show how, how it's doing that, but these guys are passing um, no residue tests. I did, that's just such an important point. <laughs> We need someone looking at it because I think it's, it's very interesting. We understand how it works. You know, microbes digest toxins like this <laughs> yeah the, yeah and it, it only takes it only takes four or five generations for you to train like a fungus to eat something so in, a, in an intact ecosystem we can train a fungus to eat glyphosate like and and paul stamets is showing that with I say paul stamets's work that's yeah exactly yeah with worse things than just glyphosate so i feel like you build that system and we build up a resilience to it yeah brilliant brilliant um, okay, uh, to Lenore's uh, last question. The parallels uh, with requirements and processes for plant and soil health to human health fascinate me. Can you give some analogies with specifics that a health professional um, could greater appreciate how chronic disease is related to how we grow our food, et cetera? Yeah, it's such a good point. And yeah. um, we now know that 100% of immunological disorders in the human gut relate to gut health right? Uh, immunological disorders full stop. So if that's like arthritis or any kind of chronic illnesses uh, relate to the, the functioning of healthy gut. Answer, so what, you know, diabetes, heart disease, any chronic illness that's managed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, allergies, anything. Right. That's yeah. right. So uh, this restoring gut function comes down to, well, what are you eating? What's the diversity of what you're eating? What chemicals or toxins are on that food? What's the biology on that food? So thinking diversity of what we eat, sourcing from places that really are looking after soil health. So they're going to have all, all of these secondary metabolites come through, the enzymes, the vitamins come through from microbiology. So if you're in these super degraded ecosystems and you're just eating conventional food, no wonder you've got all these chronic problems. And apart from anything, I find Americans seem to eat iceberg lettuce, hamburger, and tomato sauces, their vegetable, you know? So, <laughs> I'm kidding. But 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like, how do we get as much diversity into our into our bodies as possible? And it's the same thinking about soil. So I think the overlap in the conversation. Like, I'm really excited about a presentation I'm doing um, next month in uh, at the Gal Fuller School because it's myself and Sarah Keo, and we're talking. She's talking about human nutrition. We're going to be talking about soil nutrition, and the overlap is just. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So diversity, buying, uh, you know, how, as healthy as food that you can find, fresh food. Well, I just a couple of points there. I mean, we did have um, Sander Katz on a couple of weeks ago talking about fermentation and, you know, of all natures. So I think that's one thing that people can do is <clears throat> stimulate the microbiome. But as I understand it, a lot of the food that's on the supermarket shelves has been irradiated or chlorinated or in other ways had the microbiome killed. So even if yep. you've got a certified organic, you know, whatever it is, cucumbers you're buying at Whole Foods, the likelihood is that the microbiome was actively destroyed as part of the process. Even if it was grown somewhat well, you mm. know, it, it's entirely different than something that's been picked out of the ground locally from a microbiological uh, perspective. Grow your own. Grow or, your own. <laughs> well, yeah. anyways, all right. Yeah. Um, we've got five uh, minutes left. Um, do you see the questions and want to choose one or two that you want to answer? Um, uh, the anaerobic fermentation. So yeah. some of the biodynamic ones like the horsetail, the nettle, comfrey, those nasty stinking buckets. Um, what's in them is interesting in terms of you do concentrate some of those trace elements. Um, there are enzymes in that. I prefer when I'm making these brews is I do it without water. So I'm, I'm not trying to get all those stinky anaerobes because I want to get some of the beneficial bacteria and fungi. And so to do that, I might harvest the whole, let's say you've got bindweed. I'm going to fill a tub with bindweed. I'm going to put a big weight on it, a big piece of concrete and just squeeze it down. So it's a good summer project. If your children are being naughty, go and get them to fill a 50 gallon drum of thistles. <laughs> Right, that's how naughty you've been. Um, and then a big weight, squeeze it down until like, and it might take take up to a year to turn into like the sticky black stuff, like molasses is what it looks like. What happens on that is you're concentrating um, plant growth enzymes, you're concentrating the trace elements, and you're also breeding up the diseases that will take out those types of weeds. So the, if you do it with thistles, you're going to get the thistle rust will actually grow in that tub. And then when you spray that back on, it will work as a very effective herbicide, but also you'll get a growth stimulation because of the enzymes. So I prefer that than the stinking anaerobic um, buckets. I have made those in the past. I like this other one better. But I found that, you know, when you take a, you know, if, if, if people are, some people do this, they prune tomatoes or whatever, pull, pull pigweed, throw that yep. in a, bucket, a barrel, add water three days later, dump that water onto the field. You do see a profoundly, positive growth response in the plants. So yes. maybe it's not a, it's not a aerobic microbiological stimulant, but it, there's something going on. There's a lot of protozoans, you know, hormones, all kinds of stuff like that. If you, you know? take a look under your little microscope, and if you're getting a microscope, don't spend a fortune, right? My best microscopes that I use for teaching were $60 each, you know, and they're fine. Hi, uh, but you'll see a lot of protozoa in the in those brews. And so we often find most ranches and farms we go to are low in protozoa. So you're seeing a protozoa. Protozoa are what cycle nutrients they are. That they're gonna eat like 10,000 bacteria a day and then poop out that nutrient. So they kind of, it looks like you've sprayed nitrogen, but actually it's just the activity of the protozoa in there too. Yeah. Um, just, can you give a, you, you talked about the um, Gale Fuller School in Kansas. Um, yes. A question about, someone getting access to that. I'm not sure if it's being recorded or- I think, it's, I think it's full, but I really want to record the sessions with her. I think it's going to be so fascinating. So I'm going to, I'm going to set it up to record it anyway. Um, and then we'll see what, what she wants to do with it. Um, How would someone potentially access that material later? Yeah, maybe. We'll see. Facebook, find out if that is going to be available. Um, I have a series of online schools. So I have one that's just the Soil Health Foundations on, on actually how do you practically measure these different things in soil, like using these visual observations rather than just sending off a lab test. Um, and then I have another one that's a masterclass. And I have a school just for horse owners because 
hello, horse owners, <laughs> some work to do with soil. <laughs> Um, would you, in our last minute, tell us where we can find your work online? Is there a website, a company, a URL? You know, you have um, a to offer. Yeah, so yeah. So uh, the book is yeah. for the love of soil, and then the website is www.integritysoils.co.nz, nz for New Zealand. Which I think if you put .com in, it works. Um, but we also integritysoils.co.nz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. We also have an upcoming uh, coach the coaches school. So if anyone can see that this is something they'd like to do for a career and they have you know good practical experience, um, a good um, you know theoretical understanding, this school might be for you. And that's running in November. So if anyone's interested in that, then they can go to the website and and check it out. It's called the Create School. We're pretty Great. excited about that. Well, we're out of time, and um, I'm sure we could keep going for quite some time. But uh, uh, yeah, you're dangerous. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, well, there's a wealth of knowledge like this. We'd like to try to mine it as much as possible and digest yeah. it for the, for the broader audience. So, thank you for so many pearls today. Um, yeah. Oh, Matthew, that's a really cool comment. Diversity leads to stability. I think you know sometimes having those moments to kind of pull themes together is really powerful. Yeah. yeah. Thanks everyone for, for being on this live session. I know you're all pretty busy, so it's always good to see people on live gigs. Great. All, all right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah.